Tonight we begin a new study regarding the holiness of God in our series of the attributes of God or the excellencies of God. And it's always a great time for me when I begin an introduction to one of the excellencies is not only because it is one of the sermons that are the most shortest, <laughs> uh, but it is indeed the most simplest. And I say this because the only task I have is but to have us understand that God indeed is who he says he is. And tonight we move on to one of the most terrifying and most glorious truths about God found in the Holy Scriptures. And that truth is that he indeed is holy. This holiness of God is the most central truths, uh, truth to us concerning about our Christianity and our understanding of God. Believe it or not, our understanding of his holiness affects our worship, affects our lifestyle, and affects of how we view God and his excellencies as a whole. The holiness of God is what brings forth the glory and beauty in all of his excellencies. It brings forth the beauty in all of his attributes. And it generates in us, we pray, a great ground of doxology for all who see the holiness of God. Not everyone sees his holiness. Not everyone has been given spectacles and the unveiling to see his light. But those who see it, it gives them a ground of praise. Dr. Sharnock says, power is God's hand, omniscience is his eye, mercy his bowels, eternity his duration, but holiness is his beauty. Brethren, in scripture, it is said that holy is his name, according to Luke 1, that he alone is holy, according to Revelation 15, 4, and that he is majestic in holiness, in Exodus 15, 11. The question is, who is like him there? And that we, as a result of his holiness, are to worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Psalm 96, verse 9. He is holy. His name is holy. He alone is holy. He is majestic in holiness. And we ought to worship him in the splendor and in the reality of his holiness. There is no other grounds. Yet the holy God of Scripture has not always been treated with reverence by the world, with his name used in profanity and his name used for the obscene. And his being is often neglected by the continual acts of sin against God, against his holiness. Man produces such acts of abomination before the Lord, again grieving God, their maker. The world has shown no respect, no honor, no reverence to that holy name. And like this morning, we make our parallel to the world. And in context to the evangelical world, we consider them as well, that if you were to ask a Christian today, what would the priority of the church be in our modern day? The, the answers would be endless. There would be several some would say, well, to fit in this modern day, we're going to have to have better music. Going to have to have a better preaching style behind the pulpit, one that is not too serious, but one that is uh, more loose and more entertaining. Another answer would be the church should prioritize social interactions, its involvement in activism and its involvement in, in, in clubs, in rehabilitations, in helping men and women out in the world to host a charity of some sort. And some would say spiritual care or spiritual nurture. That a church should prioritize its leaders to take care of their members and the members should prioritize taking care of one another. And though those are all important things, why is it that the main priority of the church or the things that come out of the mouth of Christians today is not in consideration to the very priority of the Lord Jesus Christ given to us by example in his role model prayer in Matthew chapter 6, which is not unfamiliar to you and I? In that role model prayer, the Lord Jesus Christ begins with one or his first petition is one that most of us do not consider. And he says in verse 9, our Father in heaven, in address to the one he speaks of, a superior to him, at least during his incarnation, and he addresses his Father who's positioned in glory 
And the first petition is, hallowed be your name, he says. The word hallowed means to sanctify. It means to make holy or to, re uh, to be revered. And it's interesting that in our Lord's example of prayer, the first thing he sets forth to his disciples is the desire to exalt the name of his Father, to regard the Heavenly Father as holy, that his name may be exalted in all of the earth. We've gone through this in our gospel series of what that means to exalt the name of God in all the earth. And what's interesting is that in this same prayer, the Lord in verse, uh, sorry, in, and later on in this text says, your will be done as it is in heaven, let it be done on earth. And what's interesting is that there's this parallel that the kingdom of God manifest in the church should also be like it is in heaven. The question is, what is heaven like? Well, in heaven, there is one guarantee. If there's any attribute that is well known in the kingdom of heaven, it is His holiness. All creatures in heaven submit in reverence to His holiness. All angels, as we read in Revelation and here in Isaiah 6, in the example of the seraphs, they hush in sacred cries of song, holy, holy, holy. That's important for us in consideration of the Lord's prayer. As it is in heaven, let it be done here on earth. Brethren, if you want to know about your Christianity and your participation in the kingdom of God, there is only one question you should ask yourself in an examination of what the kingdom of God is like. If all of heaven tremble at His holiness, if you want to know what your Christianity is like, the question is, how much do you consider God's holiness in your, per in your personal life? How much do you consider His holiness? How much reverence do you have toward His holiness? Are you only consider, uh, considering His holiness here? Or do you take that trembling truth of God wherever you go? Then if you want to know about the participations of local churches with the kingdom of God and their involvement to the kingdom of God, whether they are of the kingdom of God, all you need to do is, whether, is to see and examine whether that local congregation prioritizes the holiness of God. If the holiness of God is behind the pulpit preached, if the members tremble at the thought of God's sword when it is proclaimed to them, that when they disperse and live out their own individual lives of worship, they live in utter trembling before the Almighty. We will learn a great example here in Isaiah 6. We learned in our confession this morning that we have been created in Christ as a result of His handiwork for good works. Therefore, our lives, we could say, were created to worship in the splendor of His holiness. And if you desire to know whether you are a part of God's kingdom, you're going to have to answer that question. How much do you revere His holiness? When you ask that question, regardless whether it is of yourself or local churches of our modern day, there you will see that the question of God's holiness and the truth of His holiness is quite foreign to many people. Holy in a minimal sense, but not holy to consume me. And it leaves such an emptiness in the hearts of many people. I spent some time reading Dr. Sproul's book, The Holiness of God, and he says there, there's one excellency that stumbles him the most. And really, uh, he says if there's any attribute of God that was preached most, uh, the most in Ligonier, it would have been the holiness of God because of the great impact of this study in the life of Dr. Sproul. And he said, it was as if he got born again twice. Obviously, he did not mean it in that sense where he received the Lord twice. But he was saying the first time, obviously, born again, believing in Christ. But he never really thought about the holiness of God the way that he should. He never really pondered on the truth of his holiness. He knew God was holy, but he never really studied the reality of holiness. And as the man studied, he said, he broke down and his heart was crushed 
And again, he said, it's as if I was born again a second time. And I think many of us, and I, you know, when I was reading that, I, re I examined myself. How much of this holiness do I really know of God? And if I do know of it, how much am I impacted by it? How much does my inner being tremble at that truth? Because if the angels sing it, if all of heaven submit to him in reverence because of it, what about my life? Am I affected by that reality of his holiness? And so if there is this emptiness in our mind concerning God's holiness, if we don't always revere and submit in reverence of his holiness, then worship is without purpose. Because we are co commanded to worship in the splendor of his holiness and without true knowledge of it, then our worship becomes without purpose. And then life then is without worship because it has the absence of holiness. So my prayer as we go through these couple of Lord's Day evenings in the study of his holiness is that we would not merely hear about the fact of his holiness, but that core truth about his excellency would cause us to truly worship him. I remember the story of Moses when the Lord appeared to him at the fiery bush and he was told to take his shoes off for where he stands is holy ground. In essence, Dr. Albert Martin taught a sermon as well at the same time of this and he says, well, what difference does it make for us today? Should we tremble more if we saw a literal fiery bush in front of us? Do we shake more when we see a literal flame almost consuming us? He says, if there is a people that should tremble and shake more than Moses, it should be those who have been saved in the new covenant age. Why? Because the scripture tells us the Holy Spirit lives in them. That burning spirit of God is within us communing with us, lives in us. And so what difference does it make? Do we await God to appear if, uh, uh, by a theophany so that we would just but humble ourselves and truly tremble? Is not the work of the Holy Spirit to make us alive enough to cause us to ponder upon His great beauty? So let us not just hear tonight let us pray to understand this penetrating holiness of God. For it is, in fact, our Christian goal anyway. For the text says in Leviticus, Be holy, for I am holy. And if we desire to be holy, we're going to have to be open to learning about God's holiness, for there is no other way we can be made holy unless he who is holy consecrates men. Secondly, for without holiness, no one will see the Lord, you see. Brethren, if there is a man who we ought to take note of concerning one's approach concerning God's holiness, a man considered the leader of leaders, a man considered to be the prophet of prophets, one considered the major prophet of the major prophets, major prophet because of the amount of writing that he has in his one book, and though many would debate whether it was just Isaiah who wrote the entire book of Isaiah or Isaiah number one and many disciples of Isaiah that finished off uh, for he speaks to kings 150 years later uh, after his death. And we know the prophet's ministry was not only to predict, but in this case of the book of Isaiah, he's not just predicting the, the, uh, the life of a king. He's actually talking to the kings 150 years later. But if there is any man that we should take note of considering the, the, the holiness of God, a man who, not like every other prophet, for when you examine prophets of the Old Testament, many of them came from the wilderness. Many of them were poor. Many of them came uh, from nothing. And God called them out of the wilderness for great ministry. But the prophet Isaiah is different. He was a man of status and nobility. A man who had access to the royal courts and a man who had many conversations with the monarchy of Judah. 
But this man of great nobility was chosen by God to be the spokesman of the judge of heaven and earth. This man is Isaiah ben Amos. And this Isaiah has one of the most dramatic callings in all of Old Testament writing. Dramatic because most of the prophets we read of, we don't know much about. Um, we have no idea how some of the other prophets were called. We just know they wrote a book. But when we get to the book of Isaiah and his life, it is of great drama. It is of great description. And it opens up for us here in verse 1 with the, with the description that in the year that King Uzziah died. Those words alone are quite dramatic. Because for us who don't know who King Uzziah was, when we refer back to the Chronicles, King Uzziah was a significant king of Judah. He is still significant until now in all of Jewish history. The reason why Uzziah was considered great in all of Jewish history is because there was no king like him since Solomon. And this king reigned for 52 years, beginning his long reign at the age of 16. And 2 Chronicles 26.4 says, Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed in the steps of his Lord for 52 years. The problem is, later in his life, King Uzziah became unfaithful. The scripture says he grew in pride and boasted in his wisdom. And now he went into the temple and he started to offer sacrifices that were not meant to be offered by his hands, but the priests. And God cursed him. The Bible says that God cursed him with the, with the curse of leprosy. And he was cut off from the house of the Lord. One of the most trembling statements that you can read in the Chronicles, in the life of a king, whether righteous or wicked, near the end of their life, it says that they're cut off from the house of the Lord. But despite his great unfaithfulness late in his life, the nation still called for a national mourning because he was a great king for the, at least the extent of his life. Judah just lost their great king. Most of the kings would either be lost 10 years, 15 years, 20, 30, but 52 years since Solomon, great reign of Uzziah. And remember, during this time, Israel is waiting for the Messiah to come. Israel is waiting for the Redeemer to come, prophesied and given to their King David of old that God would send his anointed one to rule on his throne. And it just seems that the nation of Israel is continually being oppressed by outskirt nations, such as Assyria. And so at the death of King Uzziah, the entire nation trembled. They lost their hope. They lost their confidence. And what was, a fr was frightening for the nation of Israel is that they placed their entire hope on an earthly man. And now Assyria rises. It's reviving again. And Assyria draws closer and closer to the nation of Israel, getting stronger and stronger. And we know, according to biblical history, that Isaiah warns them of the coming nation or the coming powers of Assyria, and they fall into Assyrian captivity later on. The nation's afraid because they had placed their entire hopes on Uzziah. That should also give us implications that if they place their hopes on a man, they've lost their hopes in the sovereign king of Judah. Furthermore, as I had spoken briefly on this this morning, Isaiah chapter 1 through 5 Though it's debated that chapter 6 should be in the beginning of Isaiah, I don't think it should because it is of purpose why the introduction to this prophet is here in Isaiah 6. Because the book opens up with a great dilemma. God says in chapter 5 that he has a vineyard and the people of his vineyard, being Israel, are wild grapes. 
What that means is that there are people called by his name but have fallen to idolatry. They are people called by his name, but they have trusted in man. They have gotten drunk. They have committed adultery. They have committed abominations before him. And so someone who reads Isaiah says, well, where is the Messiah? How could the Messiah come through the, uh, through the, through the lineage of Israel if the opening chapters of Isaiah chapter 1 through 5 are but a bunch of warnings of God and woes of God toward a disobedient nation. And what's interesting is that God still says there's going to be a holy nation. There's going to be promises fulfilled for you. But on the contrast of each chapter, you have a disobedient people. So someone who reads this book is conflicted. How is it going to be that these people would be redeemed when their hearts are far from God? This is why Isaiah 6 is important because Isaiah 6 brings forth the call of the servant. The nation will not repent. The nation will not turn to God who they have forgotten because of their trust in Uzziah. They would not turn back to the sovereign ruler of Judah unless a servant is used, a servant of righteousness that will point them back to God. This book is amazing. I encourage you to go through it all. And so all in all, the nation forgot the holy God. And on that year Uzziah died, Isaiah had received a revelation, as we have just read, a vision from God. He saw the true king high and lifted up, the sovereign one who sits on his throne. He saw the one sitting from everlasting to everlasting. Isaiah saw the Lord. I'd like us to put ourselves in the position of Isaiah for just a moment. He saw the Lord on his throne. And what's interesting is, because of the national mourning of Israel, people would go to the temple to plead to God for consolation for the nation. Meaning, God have mercy on us, save us, our king has just died. And what many think is that during this time, Isaiah was in a temple seeking consolation. And the Lord revealed this. Regardless, the vision shows or is described to be in a temple. And what's interesting is that this king who sits or the Lord who sits on his throne, he is positioned where the Ark of Covenant normally is in the temple. It says he was high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And really what that means is the glory of this Lord filled the entirety of the temple. The description, his train of his, the train of his robe, the king was known of his authority based upon the length of his robe. And so if the king's robe went from one end to the other room, he was a man of great authority. But the description of the Lord here is that his robe filled the entire temple. It means this Lord that Isaiah saw is full of glory, full of authority, full of splendor. And above him, according to verse 2, were seraphs, seraphims which had six wings each. Oh, beloved, anyone who reads this text of scripture joins Isaiah in this great feeling of terror because Isaiah's consciousness was riveted upon this immense being of God whose presence and glory filled the entire temple dominated the entire temple he trembled and these seraphims who had six wings I mentioned to you earlier that God in his creation of creatures like you and, I, you and I, or like beasts, were for purpose. But for the angel, the seraphim was created, perhaps to worship God at his very throne. But he was created with six wings, not like the bird with two, but with six. Two covering his face and two covering his feet. 
because they stood at the very presence of God. God's creation of this angel was fitting for the environment that they would be in to function according to God's purpose in them. Others take the root word of the word seraphim and they say that it speaks of creatures that are aflamed in love for God. In another sense, it is, a, it is beings that are aflamed because of the glory of God that surrounds them. The glory of God was too much to bear that even the seraphim was created to cover its face and feet. Holiness. Now the question is, Pastor, is this God in his total form? Of course not, because as we learn, God is spirit. He is but described here by, with human um, parts for us to understand. He revealed himself to Isaiah in this way, but it was still tremendous in the sight of Isaiah. But what's significant about these seraphs is that they did not only stand and cover themselves, but what is said and spoken of them in verse 3. He describes the seraphs as calling one another. It says they called to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It is what we call an alternate singing. In choir, they call this antiphonal singing. It's as if these seraphs are responding to one another in song and adoration. Dr. Oswald says, regardless whether they were singing in parts like an actual choir, one thing we can get out of this great truth is that these seraphs were communicating to one another the glory and the splendor of him who sits on the throne. They were delighting in the presence of God, is what Oswald says. But for the Jews, there's great significance in the repetition, especially in poetry. This Hebrew literary device often em uh, brought emphasis when repeated. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ, truly, truly. Or when he says, woe, and again, the next sentence, woe until the end of the chapter. And for us in our English language, we can describe emphasis by having exclamation marks or caps, all of them in caps, or nowadays we have emoticons that can add expression to our uh, statements. But for the Jews, repetition was of great emphasis. And normally the repetition of Two times meant that this is dead serious. And so the emphasis of something twice is something, but to elevate it three times, it means that this something or this someone is worth exalting to the highest degree. Brethren, this is not just the song of angels. This song is to have you on your knees considering that God in your minds should be exalted to the highest degree of your lives. God then should be of ultimate importance according to this threefold repetition. You see, in the kingdom of heaven, there is only one excellency that is repeated to the third degree. There is only one attribute of God that is elevated to the highest degree. And that is His holiness. Not only holy, you see, we say God is holy, which is correct. But to the angels, He was not just holy. He was not just holy, holy. But He is holy, holy, holy. He is beyond holy what we think concerning holiness. And this thrice holy God, His holiness did not just fill the temple, but in verse 3, the whole earth is full of His glory. That means the whole earth is full of His beauty. It's full of His majesty. Oh, in verse 4, this holiness of God shook the foundations of the thresholds. 
In the vision of Isaiah, those inanimate objects that do not speak, do not move, do not hear, those metal and wood objects that are in the temple, they too shook at the presence of their maker. They moved by his glory. But there's something beyond those inanimate objects. Another thing in that temple was shaking greater and trembling greater than the thresholds. Can you guess? What do you think, or who do you think, was trembling more than the thresholds in the temple? It was Isaiah. The man of God trembled more than anything in that temple. Because at the moment that he saw the Lord seated on his throne, he became aware of who he really was. He became aware of his whole being, of his nature, of his build. And I will tell you now that it is only, in, it is only when we are confronted by such holiness of God where we will really come to the knowledge of ourselves. That hour he came to recognize himself and he pronounced woes unto himself. Because the finite man in Isaiah, the mortal man, the incomplete man, that fallible being of Isaiah is now confronted with the infinite, with the eternal, with the complete and the infallible being of God. Brethren, such confrontation cannot help but produce despair in a man. Such confrontation with holiness cannot but bring forth despair in a man to realize his great futility and hopelessness of his own existence before a perfect God. And when he saw the reigning king of the universe before his own very eyes, this noble man of Isaiah that spoke before the kings of Judah immediately shrunk before this God. Scholars like to use the word disintegration, meaning his integrity came apart, split wide open. Some have said that the seams of his being ripped open. Not his body, but his heart was ripped to pieces at the knowledge of God's holiness. And to us today, it may not be a big deal because we have not trembled at such a sight like what Isaiah has seen. But that's the reality of the one who had called us unto himself that one day we will see his glory. And at that day, we will be with him forever. And we will all tremble at the splendor of his holiness, gathered around with his angels, crying the very same song, holy, holy, holy. The response of this man in verse 5. Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Why is it the most smallest and the most tender part? Now don't fact check me on that because I'm just... I'm just trying to say, <laughs> why is it the, one of the smallest parts of our body, the lips, is what Isaiah refers to, his unclean lips. Do you really think that Isaiah was focused upon his poor speech at that time or his derogatory communications to men? No, Isaiah was not focused upon poor speech. Really, when Isaiah said, I have unclean lips, he was referring to the heart that generated unclean lips. Isaiah was really saying, woe is me, I have an unclean heart. Remember, Isaiah in all of this book, his ministry is to bring curse to the nation. But all he's doing here is he's pronouncing curse upon himself. You see, the sight of his holiness will always keep our humility intact. The loss of that reality will cause you to boast in yourself. But he said, I'm, un I'm unclean. This is no different than Matthew 5, when the Lord says, we are poor in spirit. He recognized that he was undone, unraveled, naked. 
Calvin says, until our minds earnestly draw near to God, our minds are a vain delusion. We walk in darkness. So when God draws near to us, he brings light with him that we may perceive our worthlessness, which we could not formally see. Men of God, women of faith, when you read the scripture and you get drawn closer to the knowledge of God, what happens to you? You recognize deeper your worthlessness. That's what I'm saying. A loss of sight of his holiness and immediately we forget what it's like to worship. Again, in reference to Dr. Sproul's book, in there he speaks of a recent survey of his day. It's probably not so recent now, but a recent survey that was done during his time. And he said, it was a survey of people who used to be church members. And the survey revealed that the main reason they stopped going to church was that they found it boring. They found it boring. Brethren, the real reason, because, the real reason is not because church is boring. The real reason is because their internal beings have never trembled at the knowledge of God's holiness. That's why I asked you earlier, or I brought that question before you. If you were to ask modern churchgoers, what is the priority of the church? Give us better band or a band, a, a greater singer, greater preacher. The priority has always been the same. Whether it be the ancient church in Israel of the Old Testament or the New Testament church of those saved by faith in the person of Christ, it has always been about holiness. Whether a church has 10 people or 100 people attending it, or whether it has a choir or one man leading the worship, whether it has an eloquent preacher or a stuttering man before the pulpit, the question is, do the people who come to church tremble at the holiness of God? Because you can have it all, but if none of them are moved, it means absolutely nothing. I was asked that question again. Why do you continue to have evening services when the chairs are not filled? Aside from my love for God, because God is holy. And whether one individual makes it there, my deacon, the deacons here in the church make their way down here, God is holy. Why are you here today? Because God is holy. And I need his word to penetrate into my being the question is, do people come in reverence of his holiness? Are you unraveled? Are you stripped naked? Do you understand your own very personal human dilemma that God is holy and you are not and that God is righteous and that you are not? We need not more talented people. We need not men of eloquence to fill our pulpits. We need men who tremble at the holiness of God in a day where men do not consider his beauty. We need men and women who stand and understand his holiness, who live in terror of this transcendent being far above them, yet they live in the comforts of his grace are there any of men are there any men still today who have that oh may the god of grace help our poor souls understand better his holiness now what does it mean what does it mean that god is holy what does the word holy mean because in scripture it is used in several ways actually but i think the most important way of defining or at least our main focus tonight should be its use in association with God you ask a man what its definition is the common understanding is that the word holy is purity or cleanliness or unstained stainless but a one thing to consider is that when the seraphs were singing on the sides of the one on the throne were they really saying purity, purity, purity? Were they really saying clean, clean, clean? Or stainless, stainless, stainless? 
I think there's something greater than that, though the meaning of it is, of course, purity in the highest form. But it's far beyond just purity. Because the primary meaning of the word itself means to separate. When you say something is holy, it means it's cut in two. It is divided, separate from others. This is why Paul gives us that same use of a word when he says, be ye separate. For you cannot be equally yoked with unbelievers. Be separate, he says. So it means to be holy is to be far and different and unique. Different than others. But, okay, if we say that God is holy, he's pure, he's separate, he's different, different can also mean bad different. Different could also mean weird different. Like the animal kingdom, where all look different. Or like the human race, where we all look different. We all have different personalities. But is God just merely different from the human race and all of creation? Well, again, the repetition of holy, holy, holy means he is elevated to the highest degree. So then let us put it together then. When we say that God is holy, it means that he is transcendentally superior and separate and morally pure above all of us, above and beyond all things, totally different in a special way, totally unique like none other. Different compared to all creation, positioned in the highest degree. I apologize because coming into this sermon, I was frustrated. I was frustrated because there's not enough words to describe His holiness. And I felt disappointed in myself because, Lord, there's not enough words to describe it. And there I am, upset in my studies, Lord. I still have not understood it. Lord, I still am not content with what I have here. Even Dr. Sharnock, who's written, the, I believe, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, writings and commentary on the attributes of God, says there's really no words to describe this excellency of God. If we're talking about power, holiness is above it. If we're talking about wisdom, holiness is above it. Why? Because the holiness of God is not just one single attribute. It is a general beauty that defines his entire deity. And I'll explain to you in a bit. But Dr. Oswald says that the use of holy God indicates that this God of Israel is the godly of all gods. Dr. Hodge in understanding of what I said there. When we speak of the holiness of God, we create the attributes, a list of his attributes. There his power, there his wisdom, there is omniscience, his omnipresence. And then we put holiness in there. But why I was so frustrated in my studies is because you just can't put holiness in that list. Because holiness is what brings forth the shine to all of his excellencies. Hear what, hear what uh, Dr. Hodge says. The holiness of God is not to be conceived of as one attribute among others. It is rather a general term representing the conception of God's consummate perfection and total glory. This is why when we think of His love, His mercy, His wisdom, His power, His justice, we can't but help then say that it's not just love, it is holy love. It is holy mercy, it is holy wisdom, it is holy justice, it is holy power. Everything that he does in his actions, in the manifestation of his glory, all of it is holy. Imagine a being who everything he does is of splendor. No, holiness is not just another attribute. When, I, when we say God is holy, what we are really trying to say is he's perfect. And that word is not enough. He's perfect. 
It describes the entire being of this perfect God, who in Habakkuk 1.13, he who is of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. He is the one spoken of by John the Beloved in 1 John 1, who said, God is light and in him is no darkness. And like I said, if you may ask, as the Revelation wrote, there is none holy but you. You might ask, is there any creatures aside from God that is also holy? Well, after being saved by grace, we have been consecrated and been made holy, but I, we, you and I attest that we are far from it. We are far from holy. No, Revelation's right. There's only one that is holy. And if there's anything that is going to be made holy, it's going to have to be consecrated by the one and holy, a uh, one and holy one. So then, here in this chapter of Isaiah, when Isaiah came to understand the glory of God, Isaiah 2 simultaneously came to understand who Isaiah was. My question to you is as we have read this chapter and it has not done justice, go back home and study. But I pray that you feel the, ter the terror, the trembling of your innermost being just at the description of his glory. Isaiah learned of God and he learned of Isaiah. Question is, have you learned of yourself at the sights of his grand holiness? Calvin said, hence that dread and amazement with which, as scripture uniformly relates, holy men all over scripture were struck and overwhelmed whenever they beheld the presence of God. Men are never duly touched and impressed with the conviction of their insignificance until they have contrasted themselves with the majesty of God. In closing, ask yourselves, have you ever been consumed by the holiness of God? And I have to ask that because that's a reasonable question that many have not experienced before. And when I say the holiness of God, I'm not asking you to have experienced the same vision of Isaiah in chapter 6. But what was more important is what was happening in his heart. Because you see, when Isaiah was helpless, he was terrified. What stuns me the most is that Isaiah could have said, Lord, I beg of you, save me. I am unclean. You are holy. But Isaiah didn't even find it in himself to beg of God for salvation. Isaiah did not ask God to save him. He said, it's game over. This God is so holy and so pure, I'm utterly worthless. Woe is me, I'm lost. So then, going back to what I was saying earlier, if God promised Israel salvation and a holy nation, and God then would use Isaiah in chapter 6, but then we read of this servant, and he is so unfit, it seems. How could this prophet bring the nation of Israel back to God when he himself is lost? Well, Isaiah does his ministry. The nation still disobeyed him. They fell into Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. And it almost seems that Isaiah ends there in chapter 40. But it doesn't, because in Isaiah 53, what God was foreshadowing in the life of the prophet Isaiah would actually be done in the true servant of God, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Go to John 12, please, and we will close. John 12.
And what's interesting is that when Isaiah says that he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, again, in our, in our translations today, Yahweh is all uppercase L-O-R-D. Um, if you have an LSB, I mean, it just straight up says Yahweh. Uh, but here, in verse 1 of Isaiah 6, he says, I saw the Lord, capital L, lowercase O-R-D, the word Adonai, sovereign. But, of course, immediately, it doesn't necessarily mean that Isaiah saw Jesus of Nazareth or have understood the Jesus of Nazareth hundreds of years later. But who of the Godhead did Isaiah see in the temple? Look in John 12, verse 34. The scripture says, So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not, does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. And when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, Lord who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. That's Isaiah 53. There are 39. Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Verse 40 is a quotation from chapter 6. Verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. So the point is, if you were to ask Isaiah when you get to heaven, Isaiah, who did you see? Well, he would say, I saw Yahweh. I saw Adonai, as he describes. But really, I saw God. But if you saw John and you asked John, well, John, who did Isaiah see when he saw the Lord seated on his throne? John would say, he saw Jesus of Nazareth. This is so impactful to anyone who brings the connection together. In closing, that is the question I ask you. Because it was the glory of Jesus Christ that Isaiah saw in the temple that filled the temple and the whole earth. And John is saying that's who Isaiah saw. So fitting to the question that I asked, that this gracious God, if he has saved you in the same sense, supernaturally, he has revealed to you his glory in Christ as he did to Isaiah. Do you recognize the greatness and the reality of that? You might say, well, pastor, I wish I was in the temple with Isaiah. Well, listen. The regenerative work of the Holy Spirit to awaken you from the dead is as if it was the same experience that God had shown to Isaiah. He has supernaturally revealed to you Jesus Christ. And John chapter 1 says that he is full of glory and truth. The epistle of Paul says that he is the image of the invisible God. And yes, in Isaiah 6, Jesus would have been the image of the invisible God, but there incarnate in the flesh, he is the revelation of God the Father. He is the revelation of the triune Godhead. And so if he has opened your heart through Christ, the glory of God should be known to all who have been saved. For he has filled your temple that he has purchased with his blood, with the glory of the Holy Spirit of God. 
And this is amazing because at the moment the Lord opened our hearts, what was our response? Just exactly like Isaiah. Woe is me. I am of unclean lips. And you too say, well, Lord, I'm repentant. And one would ask why? Because my eyes too have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. He has made himself known to me. I don't see him. I don't, I can't touch him. But he lives in me. And his glory is known in my heart, in my mind. His word is so penetrating in such great holiness that it troubles my inner being and I see him all around. And at this revelation of Christ and his glory, you too now cry, holy, holy, holy. Brethren, all I wanted to do tonight is to tell you God is holy. Because it is this holiness that leads a man to say, send me, here I am. Or rather, here am I, here am I. Use me, you've changed me, you have opened my eyes to your splendor. And life is of no meaning if it's not to submit to that beauty of God. Oh, pray tonight that you may see the beauty of his holiness. Next Lord's Day, we will tackle the manifestations of his holiness and the work of his holiness toward his creatures. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for that word that you have given us through the text in Isaiah 6. Lord, again, in great frustration, no words came from this limited servant that has exhausted your perfect being. And if there is an excellency that should cause us to tremble, it is that you are holy. So holy that we could die at an instant. So holy that you have kept us by your grace. So holy that even the strongest man is crushed at the knowledge of your beauty. Let all pride crumble. Let the seams of our being rip wide open. And let your holiness be made known to all men. Let that be the priority of all who come to know you, of all who love you and all you love. Let them admire thy beauty, that in this way they may always recognize who they really are in the sight of a holy God, that they may recognize that we are unclean. For our eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. But we thank you this evening that as the seraph was sent to place that hot burning coal upon the tongue of Isaiah, upon his lips, it was far beyond his lips that was in flame. It was his heart. And we thank you that you have done the same as the glory of your spirit awakened us from the dead through Christ. You have cleansed us and revealed to us thy glory. Tonight, may it be to these men and women who have made their time to hear these words, let it go according to the intents and purposes of your will, that word penetrating in their hearts. In Christ's name we pray, amen.